just let you know a little bit uh, about the song. My, my life is a testimony of grace and forgiveness. I'm so thankful for the Lord. I'm thankful for First John 1.9. Uh, God gets me up each morning. Uh, he gives me the strength to make better choices. And each day he helps me to walk the walk and I hope you like this song. Everybody comes and everybody lies. Everyone's done. Sometime in their lives And we all sin And we don't mean to And that don't mean you Can't make it right It's the path you take The steps you make That make you who you are It's the life that you walk on everyone judges everybody else everyone's done to everyone but them Thank you, Eric. We appreciate that. Very good. Those last two phrases will be ringing in our hearts and minds throughout the course of the day, and that's good. Heavenly Father, we continue to stand uh, amazed at your amazing grace. And oh, even in response to the song, oh, that we would be living faithful and godly lives. 
for you certainly in every practical way pave the way for that. And God, even our study this morning certainly lends itself to that. And so, once again, our heart cry is that we would uh, allow the Holy Spirit of God to do everything that he desires to do in our hearts today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. We offer to you our praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Our study in Titus continues this morning. One more time, Paul, in chapter 3, verses 4 through 8, is re-impressing us with God's grace, God's unmerited favor toward us, especially as it pertains to our salvation from sin. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is uh, a sister text and familiar to most of you. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, that is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation. It's the miracle of miracles. The forgiveness of sins. Are you forgiven this morning? The salvation of a soul. Are you saved this morning? The true and total transformation of a life. Have you allowed the Lord Jesus Christ to transform your life? Not only forgiving you of your sin, but making you a new creature. That and a whole lot more, as we have been seeing and reveling in, comes to us when we put our simple childlike faith and trust in the one and only Savior. I restate that you and I need Christ because of our sin. We all are sinners and fall way short of the glory of God. I restate that we need Christ and not something or someone else, for only Christ died for us. Only Christ bore the penalty of our sin on Calvary's cross. Only Christ shed his efficacious blood. Only Christ was buried. Only Christ rose from the grave. Only Christ ascended, take a breath, and only Christ is coming again. The blessed gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. If, I were you, if you are here this morning and you have not prayed to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, if you haven't, according to Romans 10, 13, called out of your need on the name of of the one and only Savior, then I'd encourage you to do that even now. Don't wait. It's the most important thing in all of life. And God is ready and able to save. And you and I, we worship and serve a seeking and saving God. We will continue to be impressed with that, not only in our study here, but Anytime you open up the pages of the book. We have spent a considerable amount of time in this section. If I counted right, some nine sessions. The reason for that is because this marvelous miracle of miracles is multifaceted and engages all three personages of the Godhead one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The moment you put your faith and trust in Christ, God saves you. He washes you. He regenerates you. He renews you. By the way, if you're thinking that I think that you can actually read that, I know better. It's primarily for me. He indwells you. He justifies you. Where are you going to find these things, folks? He makes you an heir. And he gives you hope. By the way, we continue to be impressed with this because it's in contradistinction from this world's wishing and it's in response, it's a necessary response on the part of God's people, those who have been saved, that they would continue to exercise hope, God initially putting it in 
the hope of eternal life and our continuing to respond to God's promises and, and, and God's prophecies with hope, certain expectation that God will do what he has done, what he has said he will do. Hmm. By the way, that ought to be our philosophy. You thought I was really flubbing there, but it wasn't quite as big of a flub as you think because God actually expects that we will order our lives according to these expectations and that our perspective on his promises and his prophecies is not only that they are good as gold, but they are as good as done. So a people, believe it or not, God anticipating and certainly paving the way for, a people who are living as if God has already done what he said he will do. That's a sure word. By the way, I remind you again in passing that the word of God is forever settled in heaven. What an amazing work God has done in response to you simply exercising faith and trust in his son. What an amazing, it is indeed the miracle of miracles that is instantaneously unfolded in your heart and life the very moment you turned from your sin and embraced the one and only Savior. And, and, and I, you know, haven't done well, but if you could envision a tremendous edifice, a a great wall that's been built by the work of God in your heart and life through salvation. For we have been reveling in the things that the Apostle Paul puts his finger on in connection with those great and gracious and merciful works of God that instantaneously unfolded in my heart and yours the very moment we put our faith and trust in Christ. But it certainly is not a complete list. In fact, for all of eternity, we will not only be reveling in, but exploring the blessed and gracious aspects of our salvation. There's nothing greater. So please envision a great wall in regard to the gracious work of God through his Son, the one and only Savior, in regard to salvation. But we have come to verse 8. And that's why I wanted you to see this. You can't read the words, but maybe you can see the, the object. Because I'm about to communicate to you, and I believe this strongly, that verse 8 is a capstone. Now, a, a capstone, by the way, let me get you a little bit further in your thinking. It's not only a capstone to our text, to this little section, the finishing touch, if you will, but I believe that that has application, that it is a capstone even to this great and gracious and multifaceted work of salvation of God in your and my heart and life. A capstone is the final stone. It's the top stone. It's the thing that completes the structure. It's the crowning stone. It's the finishing touch. And I propose to you that that's verse 8. And the powerful truth that we find in verse 8. Please understand this. This is the only peace that you and I participate in the placing of. When we talk about salvation, we know it's rich and free in Christ alone. God takes great pain in expressing to us, not once or twice, but time after time after time, that salvation is exclusively the work of God. You and I cannot work for our salvation. It is presented to us as a gift, and there's only one thing to do with a gift, and that is re to receive. Sadly, most reject. Only one legitimate thing to do with it, and that is receive it. Every one of these pieces that make up this amazing, miraculous wall, 
if you will, relate exclusively to the work of God. To express that a little bit differently and for understanding, we actually were passive. Now, please be careful and listen to what I'm saying. In regard to these things, we actually were passive. In other words, after believing, actually in conjunction with believing, God instantaneously did these things. And even though we're in the process of exploring them and reveling in them, these wonderful realities, it's interesting, again, that some of them we don't feel and some of them we don't even see. We wouldn't even know about some of these things apart from two things. One, it revealed in the word of God. And two, following salvation, that we actually have practical experience in regard to these positional truths. But the capstone, salvation, exclusively the work of God, not the work of men. Salvation, we actually are passive apart from believing. And believing, by the way, is not a work. Receiving is not a work. When you receive a gift for your birthday or at Christmas, it would instantaneously cease being a gift if you said, ah, that's really nice, but I'd just soon work for it. No longer a gift. There's only one thing that we can do. A sinner condemned in his sin, we all are. There's only one thing that we can do. There's only one thing that we must do in regard to salvation, and that is believe. Receive. And I restate, by the way, that if you have not received God's gracious gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life, the forgiveness of sin. I wouldn't wait. I would do it now. I would cry out to God even now. You'd be, by the way, surprised how comfortable I would be if you right now stood up and said, Pastor Tom, I need to be saved. Would you lead me to the one and only Savior? I would love for someone to test me on that puppy. It's the most precious thing in the whole wide world. But with verse 8, we finally arrive at our response to God's marvelous, multifaceted miracle of salvation in our hearts. For you tennis players, the ball is finally hit into our end of the court. A response on our part. I mean besides believing. I mean a response in regard to the work that God instantaneously did the very moment you trusted Christ. I'm talking about what we do now that we are saved. I'm talking about what we do now that we're forgiven. I'm talking about what we do now, now that we've been redeemed and rescued from the condemnation and even power of our sin what do we do how then should we live it's the capstone and believe it or not it's single fold thank you God again for the simplicity listen salvation is simple and singular. That's why even a child can understand it. But did you know that after believing, our response to God's gracious work of salvation in our heart and life is also simple and single fold? You ready for it? I propose to you that it's the capstone. And again, this idea, you know, God, God's been doing everything. And all we had to do is believe and receive. But that, that ought to have been building up something in the heart and life of the children of God. 
a deep, maybe even passionate and perhaps pounding desire to do something in response to what God has done. Our response is single fold. Good works flowing out of a loving, thankful, and devoted heart. A single-fold response on the part of God's people for God having saved them. Good works flowing out of a thankful, loving, and devoted heart. Oh, we'll say it again in just a moment. Now, two initial observations. Can't even begin to tell you, by the way, and maybe I'll tell you now so that I don't forget to tell you later or don't get into some kind of awkward position, but I, I, I think we're going to be back with verse 8. I, I, I don't think you're going to be able to do the thing with one session. Two initial observations. One, once again we have before us the drastic, I'll listen very carefully to this. Once again we have before us the drastic distinction between true biblical Christianity and every single one of man's other religions. I don't want to say other, and every single one of man's religions. A drastic contrast between true biblical Christianity and man's religion. Religion says work, 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 and maybe you can arrive. Religion says work, 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 and maybe you can be saved. Religion says work, 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 and maybe heaven. Religion says go, 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 and then maybe you can come. And true, bibl true biblical Christianity says come, and then you can go, go, go. And Paul's point here, for God's people, is that sadly and ironically, we might forget the go, go, go part. Been saved. Wonderfully. Miraculously. But, what's that? What, but, but what God has done there paves the way for this here. Listen, I, I am not here to be critical of all the various religions that exist out there, but I will tell you one personal word in regard to that that would be very, very, very disconcerting for me. If I was in the process of embracing man's religion over and against true biblical Christianity. Because although man's various religions, again, are multifold, and although each one has its own little distinction in, in, in various ways, they all, each and every one of them, have a major foundational thing in common. It is a salvation by works system. It would be so disconcerting to me to really come to grips with what I just said when I 
embrace one of man's religious system. And with passion begin to order my life according to it. Putting my so-called faith and trust in the thing. Believing that you actually have to be one of these in order to truly be saved. Only to know that there's system after system after system after system that is exactly like the one I'm embracing. A salvation by works system. Listen, Christian, you have absolutely nothing to be embarrassed about by putting total faith and trust in the one and only Savior. And listen, only true biblical Christianity. The first word out of the Savior's lips is come. Come and be saved Come and be strengthened. Come and be satisfied. Come and be made secure. Why? So that you can serve. So that you can go, go, go. So that your life can be marked by good works. Works that not only bring honor and glory to God, but works that invest in the lives of other people so that others like you can meet and embrace the one and only Savior. You have something that is in the fullest sense of the word unique in this world. True biblical Christianity. That's initial observation number one. Two. This is a qualifier. And I probably ought to say it a couple different times. God help me to say it right. Although we certainly bear, this is a a qualifier. Something to have on the back burner. As we continue to listen, God talk about this to us, not only today, but the Lord willing next week as well. Although we certainly bear responsibility in this capstone. Everything else in this amazing wall has been exclusively done by God. But it's capped off by the child of God in response to such salvation rich and free. Good works flowing out of a thankful, you know, sometimes we just forget how thankful we are. And loving and devoted heart. Number two, a qualifier. Although we bear responsibility in doing good works in response to salvation, your, and even in our bearing responsibility for good works as a response to the great and gracious work of God in our lives through the miracle of salvation, even then and even with our good works, we are completely and totally dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ for the strength that we need in order to faithfully perform the good works and the motive we need in order to be proper in that all-important realm only comes through a vital relationship with and dependency upon your one and only Savior. Salvation isn't the end. How many times have we said it? But it's the beginning of a great life, a wonderful adventure where we don't set aside trusting Christ as we did at the moment that we were saved, but rather we learn to trust him more and more practically day by day. Don't forget that one of the things that God did when you put your faith and trust in Christ 
is he sent the Holy Spirit of God to permanently tabernacle in your heart. And the miracle was instantaneous, and so too the provision for you and me. Because all of a sudden, you want to say it like a superhero, we have the power! <laughs> Got to say it like that. All of a sudden, we have the power. And oh, don't misunderstand. We're not talking about power to be a goofball. We're talking about power that leads the, leads the way to faithful stewardship and service. Power to obey. And God always covers all the bases. We're so very glad for that. Because the Holy Spirit of God He's not only responsible for affording us the power we need to live a faithful life, he actually is the source of our serving Christ with proper motive. And please understand this, you could not be marked by good works before you met Jesus. Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. But the miracle of salvation has equipped you and me to now live the life, Christian life, that Christ calls and commissions and commands us to live. We now are equipped to obey. Not one or two times, but faithfully, yea, by way of life style. And we now are equipped to serve God with proper motive. How could it be anything but service coming out of a thankful, loving devoted heart. Did you know among the myriad of reasons why God saved you is this. He saved you so that you could and would produce good works. What an interesting biblical phrase, good works. I quoted earlier Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but there's a verse 10. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, that is a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto, guess what class? Good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk there in. It's a pervasive thing throughout the whole word of God. Matthew 5, 16 certainly comes into play when we think about this biblical phrase, good works. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In the classic text in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto, guess what class? Good works, every single good work. Christ says, come and be saved, Come. And be equipped. And then go, go, go. And do, do, do. But alas, again, sadly and ironically, some of us may have forgotten the go, go, go part. By the way, this phrase is so very important, not only God, but to the Apostle Paul. We're here in Titus. I want to note something with you very quickly. This is the third time in this tiny little epistle that we have this phrase from the Apostle Paul. Let me just note that with you very quickly, back in chapter 2 and verse 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good 
works. Take a look at verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And then we have our text, of course, Titus 3 and verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. And Paul still isn't done, for he uses the phrase again in verse 14, and let ours also learn to maintain good works. Man, is this important to God. And by the way, it's no mistake that the Holy Spirit of God in the Word of God ties our sense and feeling of security to the necessary and proper response to God having saved us. Namely, good works flowing out of a thankful, loving, and devoted heart. Here's the question. Coming back next week, right? Coming back? It'll be our lowest attended service in a long, long time. What does God mean by good works? They ought to be marking our lives. I mean, we actually already should have moved into a faithful pattern. But what does God mean by good works? We'll we'll take a second session to explore that. In, In between times, please make sure that you are saved and know this please know this man's myriad of religions each one has the cart before the horse even a child can understand that that ain't gonna cut it. It's not works that leads to salvation, but rather it's salvation that leads to works. Are you saved? And child of God, are you working? More to come on that. Would you bow your heads? please, for just a moment. We've really been emphasizing salvation throughout the course of God's message. Of course, you ought not be surprised by that because he is a seeking and saving God. I realize that we can throw terms around that you perhaps won't understand, but the fact of the matter is we've expressed and explained what we mean about this blessed term, salvation. And so I think it's with a measure of understanding on your part that I can ask and you in turn can answer the question, are you saved? Have you, because of your sin, embraced the one and only Savior? Has there been a point in time in your life when you prayed to receive Christ as your own personal Savior from sin? Are you forgiven this morning? Are you saved? Are you heading to heaven? Have you put your faith and trust in Christ? If you haven't, would you do that now? I plead with you in the quietness of this moment. It's ultimately between you and God. And again, don't let the enemy, uh, you know, sidetrack you. You you may say, I I don't really know what words (laughs) to use. Listen, be honest with God. Admit that you're a sinner. Realize that the Lord Jesus Christ is God's one and only solution to your sin and pray to receive Christ. Do it even now. 
invite Christ into your heart and life as your own personal Savior. And then see if God doesn't do what he has said he will do, not only in saving you, but absolutely equipping you for life and ministry. I want to pray for you. I will do nothing to embarrass you, but you actually just now have prayed to receive Christ, and you would like me to know so that I can pray for you not only today, but in the days ahead. Would you slip your hand up just for a moment? I'll acknowledge that a hand's been raised, and you can place it right back down. You, you prayed to receive the one and only Savior today you want me to know. Child of God, I'm, I'm wondering if we're going to be willing to go with God deeper. Ultimately embracing what is an, a tremendous challenge here in verse 8 that serves as a capstone to the gracious, marvelous, multifaceted miracle that has unfolded in your heart the moment you trusted Christ. God, continue to impress these things upon our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Trusting God for salvation and then living for him. The song that came to mind was 454, Trust and Obey. Let's all stand together singing the first verse of 454. When we walk with the Lord in the light of Brother Ken Wade, to please close us in a word of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come to the close of our morning worship service thanking the Apostle and uh, the Holy Spirit of reminding us of the wonderful salvation and all of its facets available to us on the basis of faith alone. And we thank you and praise you for your love and mercy and grace extended to each of us. And we do ask that as we leave this service that we will be challenged anew and afresh to serve you and to allow God, the Holy Spirit, to empower us to accomplish works that would bring honor and glory to your name. Travel with each one through the hours of the afternoon. Bring us back to a, this service tonight and we'll thank you in Jesus name we pray amen, amen.